Hello, I'm Larry Lormond, and we are studying a unit, summer unit on prayer. We're already in lesson eight. My goodness, time is moving by. We're going to be done with July. I hope we're done with the heat soon enough because it's just been blazing. But I'm here on a Tuesday morning recording for this week. Trust you've had a great week. Um, just moving towards the weekend. Here we go. Uh, lesson title is Jesus Prays for Us. I'm going to talk about that title here in a moment. We're in John chapter 17, 20 through 26. Um, Jesus is kind of getting, he's at the end of his ministry. He knows he's going to the cross. Uh, he is trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. And they're confused. They're thinking that he's going to go defeat the Romans and uh, he's going to be king, an earthly king, and um, they're going to live together in the kingdom. And that's their idea of the kingdom. Even though Jesus described the kingdom differently than that, they just didn't get it. It took the Holy Spirit for them to truly understand uh, where Jesus was going with his kingdom. The main idea of the lesson is our shared faith in Christ is the glue that bonds us together. Sometimes in this unit, we'll look at this main idea and the titles, and Wesley and I will look at each other and go, uh, what's that got to do with it? We know that uh, we're a shared faith, and uh, we need to be together. Uh, we need to be together with Jesus, what we need to be. The quick read is, Jesus prayed that we would keep the unity of the Spirit, be with Him to see His glory, and be filled with, with love. Now, that's really what the lesson is about. He prayed that we would have unity. He prayed about a lot of things. And, I, you know, if you're going to comfort a person at the end of your life, what would you talk about? Well, Jesus talked about heaven. He talked about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he talked about how we should act when he's not here. Uh, we know the disciples were prone to not act the right way, even when Jesus was in their presence. So he was a little bit concerned about how they would act when he wasn't there. Let's do a little bit of introduction to the lesson. I have a few points, uh, things that I've thought about. Um, I don't know what your mental picture of heaven looks like, but I believe that Jesus was a person, a real person, and he physically was resurrected. I mean, he ate. You could feel him. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a spirit. Um, he, um, he was physically resurrected. He had a real body, okay? So I believe when he ascended into heaven, I, I see God the Father as a spirit, okay? He doesn't have a physical body. We describe him as a body because we... Talk about God's face and his hands and things like that. But he is a he's spirit. God the Son, Jesus, is in heaven today uh, with a physical body. Now that's kind of a stretch. And I believe that the spirit is the person of God that's doing the work of God. Wherever God's presence is. We know he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But the Spirit is doing the work of God here on earth and in heaven. So there are three different entities. And I believe that when Jesus was here on earth, he was physically not present with the Father. So he prayed. Okay. But now that he's in heaven, he's physically with the Father. And I believe that he speaks to the Father. Okay. And so when you say Jesus prays for us, I think that he does speak to the Father about us, and uh, but he's in the presence of the Father to do that. So I think it's different now when he prays for us than it was when he was physically on the earth, okay? I might be straining on a gnat, but that's what I thought about when I looked at this, okay? So, park that, move forward. <laughs> so, um, I believe that the Lord creates an environment around us that is conducive for our faithfulness. I think that when Jesus 
prayed for his disciples, uh, he prayed that they would have unity. But that was still a decision on, on the part of believers and his disciples. They could have not been unified. And we know that through history, the church hasn't been. I don't believe that when Jesus prayed for the church and prayed for us in the garden or in the upper room, we'll talk about that in a moment, that he had in mind quite what the church looks like today. I think God takes us where we're at, and he's pleased with our worship, whatever form that is. But it does look different, okay? The church has manifested itself in a lot of different ways on earth. I believe that as long as they love Jesus and they worship the true Jesus, not some made-up Jesus, um, which some do, uh, then he's honored by that and he's pleased with that and, and he uses that. But um, it's not quite what he had in mind. It's because he gave us free will. I guess you know I'm a free will person. You've, you've gathered that. So uh, I think that God creates an environment for us to be faithful, okay? But we still have a choice. And sometimes we choose right and sometimes we don't. He doesn't give up on us. So I had to ask myself too, where is Jesus? You know, he prayed a lot during the last days. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that because all the disciples went to sleep. Uh, but here, if I'm reading it right, it looks to me like he's still in the upper room for this part of uh, his prayer life, okay? I think he leaves here and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and then he prays there again. But they're still in the upper room. That's the kind of questions you need to look at when you study God's Word. Is look at the context of it. Where is he? Where has he been? Where is he going? Who's with him? Those kinds of things. That will clue you in quite a bit to circumstances and things. Uh, yeah, one note that I came and added this morning before I started was um, Jesus prayed a lot. And he didn't just pray in the difficult, the, the, the easy days. He prayed on every day. Okay, So these are very difficult moments uh, that Jesus is having. And... Um, you know, he prayed mostly for other people. He prayed for his disciples. Uh, the only time that you ever hear him talking about himself is, you know, it, he asked the Father, is there another way? And he knew that there wasn't. And then he said, well, then your will be done. That's really the only time you see Jesus praying about things personally for him. Uh, everything you see in this lesson today is about other people. And that's really the way our prayer life should be. So he prayed during his most difficult moments. Now, my goodness, when I looked at this lesson, you know, when you teach scripture, you kind of have to divide it up a little bit uh, because he's saying different things at different times. And it's always better to kind of divide it up and draw some lines. I literally draw lines in my lesson book. I don't know that you can see that, but I draw lines and um, think about you know, things that the scripture is saying. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult to do that today. But I I uh, divided up four different ways. I think Jesus prayed for future believers. Isn't that interesting? That he knew there would be others that would come. He prayed that we would have unity. I guess he knew we weren't going to be unified. Uh, he prayed that we would be with him. And I think that's a precious thing. And then lastly, he prayed that we would love one another. He talked about that a lot. So let's read it. 1720. My prayer is not for them alone, not just these 12, not those other disciples on the earth. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Isn't that interesting? Jesus knew that we would come. There would be disciples. There would be believers. They would come for generations to come. And so he's praying. He prayed for us there. Isn't that interesting? I guess that's how the the lesson title comes in, is that um, he, uh, he knew others would come. So he's praying for them. Um, that, you know, we know he's all-knowing, but he knew then that we would believe. He knew that we would. 
Isn't that a powerful thing? He knows those that will come in the future. Uh, praying for my grandchildren right now. They're little. And uh, they're just now learning about Jesus. Such a precious thing. Our son, y'all know, is, he's Anglican. And they're, they're Christian too. Just a little different flavor there. Uh, but he was so pleased that their like 16, 17-month-old son went to church and came home and was saying the name of Jesus. I tell you, that was a big factor in them joining that church and becoming a part of that body in San Antonio was the fact that his baby went to church and came home talking about Jesus. Isn't that a precious thing? My prayer is one day they will come to know Jesus. And, and I know that will happen because of the church and because of his parents, their parents. So he prayed that he prayed for future believers. Second thing is he prayed for is that they would we would have unity. Well, let me read this section. Um, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who would believe in me th through their message that all of them may be one. One. We should be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also in us also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's a major theme is he he particularly in John talks a lot about, you know, the Father sent him. And you know, they would come down on Jesus and Jesus would say, Why are you mad at me? I'm just doing what God told me to do. That's that's John. That's the flavor of John when you read that. Um, they, that they will know that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Are we in complete unity? I hope we are. Most of the time we are. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Well, he want, the reason it, that unity is not is a good thing in and of itself, but unity communicates things. Okay, um, my wife and I being unified communicates something to our children and to our grandchildren. It communicates that we love one another and we respect one another, and we truly are together. And uh, it's always been that way, and it's always going to be that way. And there's comfort in that. Uh, my children are comforted by the fact that my wife and I have unity. And it's going to always be mom and dad. And mom and dad are always going to be together. And uh, that communicates things. It's, it's positive in and of itself, but it multiplies positive things. So Jesus is praying that we would have unity. You know, unity means that you don't always get your way. Uh, unity means that you put the needs of the other person above before your your own. Um, it, it, you know, doesn't mean that it's always easy. But it means we are together, we're going to be together, we love one another, and so let's move forward together. So Jesus prayed that they would have unity. And by and large... The church has. We've had our moments. I'm talking about the universal church. The church through history. We haven't always um, done the right thing. But, uh, you know, the message has gone forward. And there, and we've been mostly unified. Let's put it like that. I, I'm grateful that our church, our church is unified. Uh, we all have our opinions. But, you know, we move forward together. Third thing is that Jesus prayed that we would be with them. Let me tell you what, that is marriage language. You know, when um, the, the bridegroom would go and build a place for him and his bride to live, and it was always part of the father's house. But then he would go and get his bride, and then they would be together. And... Um, Jesus, I think, appreciated that and loved that idea of in marriage and in, particularly in, in a wedding. Um, so this is, this is marriage language. 
I remember Jill and I getting married, and we didn't care where we lived. Where we lived, we could live in a cardboard box as long as we were together. And and Jesus craves that. He wants that. He wants that relationship between himself and believers. So let's look at that. That's verse 24. Uh, this is precious language too. Verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me. Isn't that something? To be with me where I am. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Um, you know, Jesus, again, in four, John 14, you know, he talks about um, us being with him. That's a recurring theme. He, he values us so much that he wants us to be with him. Last thing that he prayed about is that we would love one another. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to have the kind of love between each other that he has for the Father. And that's a perfect love. That's a giving love. It's a forgiving kind of love. It's a godly kind of love. Well, let's look at some truths. I wrote three of them down. That three, complete number three. Here we go. First truth is Jesus is very much aware of what is going on with us. And he cares about where we are spiritually in our relationship to the church and other believers. Uh, Jesus is not just in heaven right now, unaware of what's going on with you and me. He knows everything going on in our life, and he cares. Uh, that is um, a positive. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's comforting to me to know that even though, uh, even before I pray and ask him to to work in a situation in my life, he knows. He knows the circumstance. He knows all the issues are involved. He know he knows the people. Um, he knows, and that's that's a beautiful blessing. Second thing is unity is paramount in the kingdom, and most things among believers that we may argue about don't rise to the point of being important enough to cause disunity. Um, unity is a major, 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 major thing among believers. Don't be a person who causes disunity. 99% of the time, the thing that you're so worried about or you're so upset about, at the end of the day, is not big enough, not a big enough issue to cause disunity. Okay? So you got to weigh these things out, and most of the time, they don't rise to the point of causing disunity. Last point. I think this is maybe a repeat in some ways, but if you're going to cause disunity in the body of Christ, you better be right, and you better have the facts right. And most of the time, believers don't. Don't. So, I've been in the ministry on church staff for a long time, and most things are not important enough to cause disunity. Okay? Okay. So let's remember that as we move forward. Let me pray with you. Jesus, we love you. We love each other. I thank you for your precious prayer. I thank you that it's recorded. We see your heart and your, your emotions in the prayer. And we see the things you really care about. I pray we'd care about the things you care about. Help us to love one another, to love you, and to stay together. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you. You have a great week. Stay cool.